So I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Roland Fletcher. Uh, when we were preparing the, uh, the, this conference, I felt it was essential to get an historic, historic perspective on what disruptions in the balance of supporting systems can do to societies. And there's many examples of societies that crumbled when the circumstances that made them prosper changed. And one of those examples, of course, is Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And it just so happened that I knew the world expert on Angkor Wat, Roland Fletcher, who was a speaker at one of our conferences, uh, one of our complexity conferences. I think it was Emerging Patterns in 2015. Now, Roland exemplifies what, is to be, what it is to be an interdisciplinary scientist, using combinations of different approaches and different fields of knowledge to understand phenomena that cannot be understood by any one scientific discipline alone. And the demise of Angkor Wat is an example of such phenomena, I suspect. And with this combination of the theory and philosophy of archaeology, with the anal analysis of the large-scale cultural phenomena over time, Roland is uniquely qualified to give us an historical perspective of what may happen to societies if the circumstances under which they prosper change. So it is with great pleasure and expectation that I ask you to welcome our next speaker. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, thank you particularly to Jan for the invitation. Uh, this has uh, been uh, quite an education, I have to say. Um, what I'm going to do today is to talk about a, uh, a black elephant that we know of, which is climate change, but a previous example of climate change. But sitting on that black elephant is a black swan. And the black swan is a condition that we knew nothing about until 2010 when work by geoscientists looking at climate change in Vietnam combined with the archaeology of what was being done in Angkor. I'm not going to cheer you up, but I must emphasize to you that human beings are extremely resilient and survive. And part of the story, I would emphasize, of this demise of the great city of Angkor is that people tend to talk about the fall of Khmer civilization, the fall of the civilization of the people who built and occupied Angkor. This is not a phrase I would recommend you use in Cambodia, because the Khmer look at you slightly puzzled and say, what fall? Our civilization seems to be quite well. And even more significant, though that great city, and it was the most extensive city of the pre-industrial world, did indeed fall. It did have a demise, and it was presumably very bad for a very large number of people. It is important to remember that the Khmer state never broke. The Khmer state moved sideways. It moved down to the southeast, to the Phnom Penh area, maintained integrity, and after the demise of Angkor, 150 years later, those rulers were back in Angkor, regilding the towers of Angkor Wat as their state temple. But that state temple by then stood in the middle of a gradually reforesting landscape not the great urban landscape. So it's important to remember in what I'm talking about that there may be some very serious implications for the modern world, and particularly for the giant cities of the modern world. But the issue we face is not bewailing that this may happen. It is surely that our job is to mitigate disaster and minimize tragedy to whatever degree we are capable. I'm going to look at the relationship between risk and urban demise. 
and the conjunction that I'm looking at is giant low-density cities, giant, immovable, highly inertial infrastructure, and extreme conditions of climate change. <clears throat> the implication of the story of Angkor, and in fact of two other urban systems in the pre-industrial world in Sri Lanka and in Central America, is that giant low-density cities, which is essentially the great places that we live in today, are extremely vulnerable to breakdown due to severe climate change. But what is more severe is that the regional urban networks of low-density urban systems also break. Now, I opened deliberately with a comment about Khmer civilization didn't fall because there is a current ongoing and quite vigorous debate in anthropology and archaeology about the issue of collapse and the somewhat emotive term of collapse. I would first of all emphasize I have a very high regard for Jared Diamond. And I have a high regard for him because he puts things into the brain of the public with great vigor and effectiveness. He is strongly criticized by many of my colleagues in anthropology who emphasize, for instance, that though the great Maya cities of Yucatan no longer exist, the Maya do still exist. They do still have a culture and they still function. And that was my point about the Khmer. What we have to do when we're talking about this issue which we have labeled under collapse is to identify what the phenomenon actually is rather than talk in terms of the moralizing terminology of collapse. Now, very fortunately, uh, we do know that the past is useful. Uh, we do use the past for all sorts of purposes of judging the future, and most of you pay varying levels of insurance for your cars and so on because of your age, because of where you live, because insurance companies add up the past and see what it looks like. And there have been occasions, quite recently, where people who have done historical studies, like Bob Bernanke of the Great Crash, who used his understanding of that situation to assist with the decisions that needed to be made in the recent financial crisis. The difficulty, as is well identified by Peter, by Peter Ho, is that there are various kinds of information in the past, particularly those unknown unknowns. There are phenomena hidden in time which we need to concern ourselves about and which we only learn about because the historical sciences of astrophysics or archaeology or geology or paleontology discover them. Probably the most serious one, it's a sort of remote but could be imminent problem for us, is represented by this. This was an extremely bad day in the history of the Earth. 65 million years ago, probably an asteroid impacted on this planet and terminated the existence of the dinosaurs and quite a lot of other life forms. The irony, if you can think in terms of evolutionary irony, is of course that but for that very large bang, it is unlikely that you and I would be standing here talking because the mammals would not have become the dominant animal on this planet. So disasters have very curious consequences. What this impact led to is a phenomenon we can actually see, which is the crater that is hidden underneath the north end of Yucatan. We can actually see this phenomenon 
physically. We can see the layers of damage and impact which it produced, and we can model its consequences. What I want to argue today is that from the archaeology of the demise of the great low-density cities of the pre-industrial world, of the agrarian world, we are looking at another potential black swan. The first thing to emphasize, and it's not entirely familiar to many of us, is that human beings quite habitually live at a very wide range of residential densities in their settlements. We tend, from a European or an Asian background, to think in terms of people always living close together and in compact spaces. And quite reasonably, you have a sense in Singapore that this is quite normal. But it is only part of a tiny range of the spectrum over which human beings organize themselves. So, for example, those of you who are familiar with this, the famous hunter-gatherers of the world, like the Kung Bushmen and the Kalahari, live in regions with the lowest occupation densities on Earth, and they live at the highest residential densities within their camps of most people on Earth. They practically sit on top of each other. There's no constraint. They could spread themselves out as much as they like. For social reasons, they don't. They live at extremely high densities. But in the deserts of Australia, completely opposite. The Australian Aborigines out in the far deserts quite habitually live in campsites where the fireplaces are spread out over hundreds of meters. These are really sprawling, low-density occupations. What is important to notice is that this is completely normal for one of the great socioeconomic systems of the world, mobile hunter-gatherers. When we come on to farmers, agriculturists, we tend to think of farmers living in compact villages. I've actually lived in this place. This is so compact that all the buildings are next to each other and you walk from roof to roof to go to houses. It's like Chapel Hewick in early Anatolia. But that's only one end of the scale. There are, again, in Africa, in Nigeria, societies where all the houses in a village are spread out over huge areas and people's farmland is immediately around them and you go for many kilometers across the landscape as part of a single cultural system. I have again lived in a place like this in northern Ghana and one of the spectacular beautiful characteristics of this place is that people would communicate using xylophones. When you wanted to indicate that there was a ceremony or a party going on, you got on your xylophone. It's just beautiful. You can hear this for miles across the landscape. But these are big, open, sprawling, low-density systems. It is also the case that agrarian, urban societies live everything from tight, compact cities like the Chinese walled cities or the European ones right through to the vast, low-density systems that I will describe. So the key point to notice is that there isn't some normal band, narrow band of residential density within which we operate. We operate over an enormous range within our settlements. So when you plot up points for settlements uh, which we know of historically and anthropologically, population of the communities along the bottom axis on a log-log scale, and residential density on the vertical axis. This is, oops, sorry. This is the Kung Bushman up here at incredibly high densities, but very small numbers of people running across to our industrial cities over here. And there are two crucial things to notice because this is part of the big theoretical model that frames this work. 
is that there are two sets of boundary conditions on the behavior of human beings. These are boundary condition models. The one that is relevant here is this upper limit, which is essentially a density limit on the viability of human settlements. This is simply the upper limit beyond which interaction cannot viably function. But notice that societies range from up here, like Imperial Rome, for instance, all the way down to here. Down here somewhere is our core. And this line here is particularly significant because this is the line for the highest rural regional densities in the world. So if you take whole provinces in China and India, they can get densities up to about five to seven persons per hectare on average for the whole province. And what that means is that once you drop below that line as a settlement, there is no area constraint on how wide your settlement can grow. If you go down here, you are in potentially a zone of infinite possible expansion. The other crucial thing that you need to know about the history of human cultures over the past 15,000 years is, as you would all know, we have gone through three great transitions in settlement growth. The first one, back here, after 8,000 BCE, was that our settlements, our compact settlements, increased to more than one hectare in extent. The next great transition, which we know of as the urban transition, is this one after about 3,000 BCE, when settlements reach sizes of larger than one square kilometer. And then the Industrial Revolution, which we're all thoroughly familiar with, is where we jump to beyond 100 square kilometers for our compact settlements. And the point to notice about this diagram, which is extremely important for the argument I'm making, is that there is complete continuity up here. Compact settlements are extremely durable. Compact settlement networks are extremely durable. And there are successions of continuity and connection through time, from Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean, from the Eastern to the Western Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean to Europe, for example, all over China. This is the continuous story of the development of human urbanism. But we also do something else. As you are acutely aware, all over the world, enormous places like the East Coast Megalopolis, the great Chinese complexes like the Pearl River Delta complex in Shanghai, we are dropping to very low densities. And what is significant in the history of the growth of settlements over the last 15,000 years is that there have been three of these trajectories. The one we are now in, which is very recent, has almost no history, and we are right in the middle of it. The previous one, which is typified by Angkor, which I'm going to talk about in some detail, and a much earlier one, which I'm not going to elaborate in great detail, which involves some very famous places like Great Zimbabwe in southern Africa, Cahokia in northern North America. These are big, low-density, sprawling places that get up to sizes of about 70 square K. These ones get up to about 1,000 square K, and these ones get over 10, 100,000 square K in extent. The critical thing about this diagram is that there is no continuity at this level. There is no connection at all between these settlements and these settlements, and there's absolutely no connection between these low-density cities of the Maya, Sri Lanka, and the Khmer, and the low-density cities of the modern industrial world. They each come from an entirely separate ancestry, and they are each completely terminal. 
and the question is why. Let's quickly have a look at the story so you get an idea of what's going on. We're going back in time. <coughs> this is the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> the Industrial Revolution is intriguing because it is essentially occurs initially only here. And these are where the great sprawling modern low-density cities of the world are primarily located. This is what they look like. This is the famous sky at night. And actually, can we cut down the lights a little bit? Is that possible? Can we cut the lights down in the room? This is a study which was done over the last decade by Angel and his team, plotting what is happening to the densities of the great cities of the world. And the overall trend, as you can see, is down. Our cities are all moving, big cities are moving to low density. We have no big high density cities on the planet. We have some, but they're all very small. Generally, and it's a bit of a surprise if you look at Japanese cities and Indian cities, which you would tend to think of as compact and high density, generally what you find is that the majority of the settlements are at the lower end of the density range. The great low-density giants are, of course, the famous ones we're familiar with, the East Coast Megalopolis, which is a continuous urban landscape stretching from Boston in the north to Washington in the south. And, of course, the great giant of the world at the moment, Shanghai, which started off here and now incorporates this entire greater Shanghai entity. These are the great low-density giants of the modern world. So if we go back in time a bit, the earlier trajectory to low density commences from the compact early civilizations, of which there were about six starting with Mesopotamia in 3000 BC, the Chinese in the second millennium. And these blue circles represent the location of the low-density agrarian cities that developed out of this ancestry. The Maya, the Sinhalese on Sri Lanka, and the Khmer in mainland Southeast Asia. This is the story in Sri Lanka. The great cities, the Buddhist cities from the 4th century BC through to the 12th, 13th century AD are up in the center north. This is what they look like. All you see, of course, are the great ritual monuments, the stupas, but this whole landscape was covered with small shrines, occupation places, all of very similar size. It's a very equisimilar landscape. And this is a single, huge operating entity. When you go to the New World, to the Yucatan Peninsula, the famous places I'll be talking about are the classic Maya sites down in the south, of which the most famous is a great city called Tikal. This is a rather gorgeous National Geographic image of the center of Tikal. The problem with many of these images is that this is the easiest part of these cities to represent, but the urban complex covers 200 square kilometers of spread out housing all the way around the landscape. So when you do an archaeological survey, which is huge hard work, this is what you actually see. That's that middle that you just saw. But this is the housing. It isn't arranged into tight streets and grids. It sprawls out across the landscape over nearly 200 square kilometers. This is another example of this low density system. The third one, Iron I will describe in more detail shortly. The third of the great transitions the first one that occurred, derives from the initial development of sedentism. Sedentary agricultural communities occurred in about 15 places in the world first. And these red circles 
represent the areas where later on, out of that initial development of sedentism, you get the great low-density anomalous sites, as we call them. The most famous in North America is a place called Cahokia, which covered about 12 square kilometers. And it consists of enormous amounts of open ground, patches of occupation, spread out over this huge 12 square kilometer area. In Europe, in the Iron Age, you get the famous Oppida. These are bounded areas, some of them as large as about 7 to 12 square K. But occupation is extremely open inside. These are not compact, dense places. And when you go to the New World, to Chaco Canyon, which covers about 70 square kilometers, Caral in Peru, which probably covers about 50, and the gigantic Scythian encampments in Ukraine, which cover 40 square kilometers. There's almost nothing inside here. There's just patches of occupation and industry, and that's the gigantic Scythian settlement compared to that 12 square K of Cahokia. The point about these settlements is that they're low-density, sprawling places, and they have an interesting problem. Almost without exception, though very interestingly with one exception, they have no continuity to their successors. When these systems go, they are not replaced by a similar mode of organization. This pattern of settlement permanently disappears. So in the southwest, for instance, you move to very compact, tightly defined pueblos. There's no continuity of settlement form, and there appear to be major disruptions after relatively short histories. Now, what is interesting and useful about this set of data is that you might look at them and say, oh, yes, this is a doomed system. But it's not as simple as that, because the most famous case of this pattern of organization is what are called the Yoruba towns in Nigeria. And they have an ancestry of many hundreds of years, and they have continuity right through into the colonial period. So there is some circumstances, and this is crucial for our later discussion, in which a low-density system can somehow keep itself going. So these cases become crucial for our understanding the prospects of low-density systems. If you look at these uh, settlements on three scales. This is the initial trajectory. The size is up to about 100 square K. The agrarian urban one with sizes up to about 10,000 square K, but the biggest is 1,000. And then the modern ones, which go up to 100,000 million square K. So these are three different scales of development. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look in detail at Angkor and look at the obvious question you have to ask about Angkor. It's enormous, it's immensely wealthy. Why did it end? So to go back to that diagram I showed you before, the key point of this talk is that you get continuity in compact settlements and you get disjunction in dispersed systems. That's a summary of the story. And what I'm now going to do is to look at Angkor, which is in the second of these great trajectories. So, Angkor is located in modern Cambodia, just on the north side of a great lake called the Tonga Sap. The reason it's located there in pragmatic uh, point of view is that this is an area which floods from 3,000 to 10,000 square kilometers every year. 
creating 7,000 square kilometers of annually flooded rice land. If you're there, you rule the greatest single production source of rice in mainland Southeast Asia. Also, if you're here, you rule the routes across mainland Southeast Asia this way, and you control the route up here and up the Mekong. Angkor is astonishingly beautiful. It is commonly epitomized by its single largest temple. This is Angkor Wat. This here is one temple. It is the same aerial extent as the campus of my university in Sydney. It's a kilometer and a half on each side. The moat is 200 meters wide. This platform here, to give you some idea of the power and wealth of this society, is a three million cubic meter artificial platform that is four meters deep down here. All that landscape there is entirely artificial. That's not a moat dug out of the ground. It is a water system with a barrier around it. This is the scale of what these people can do. The point about this diagram is that you have to make a gestalt shift because the edge of the urban landscape of Angkor is out there at the base of the hills. And the total area of urban area of Angkor was about 1,000 square kilometers, but looked nothing like the way you would think of a pre-industrial city like Rome or Edo. It, in fact, would have looked remarkably like 1950s Los Angeles. So to give you an idea of scale, that's Angkor Wat. This is Angkor. And in here, there are somewhere on the order of four to 5,000 water tanks, which are the places around which people are congregating. So if you had flown over Angkor in the 12th century on a nice sunny day, you would have seen something like flying over Los Angeles, the light gleaming off the water tanks like it gleams off the swimming pools of Los Angeles today. You are looking at a settlement with a relatively dense center, just like the great low-density cities of the world today. The middle of Shanghai is fairly packed, spreading out to an enormous dispersed landscape. This is, in fact, in European terms, a conurbation. There was a town here and a town here, which were connected together by a center here and roads, and then grew into this great network. It is also, in the terminology of Southeast Asia, a desakota. It is a rural urban. Immediately outside Angkor Wat, the largest single religious building until the 20th century, this area is rice fields. But immediately here, there is housing along embankments, along canals. And there are all these people living here. And this is a commuter city. This temple here, the Ta Pram, in the late 12th century, had a staff. This is all documented in inscriptions on the wall of 12,640 people, including 615 dancers. And they did not live in the temple. They lived somewhere around here, and they commuted to work. And the same is true of all of the other temples. And this temple staff of 12,640 people was supported by 66,625 farmers. They're documented. And they deliver to this temple and to this temple 2.5 million kilograms of rice a year. That's their job. And they deliver it on a just-in-time basis. This is not an annual harvest system. There is no storage in these big temples. The rice is stored in the farmers' houses and delivered successively to the temples. It's a clever system. The risk of loss is carried entirely by the farmers, 
not by the institutions that want the rice. So these are huge commuter service cities. And in the 14th century, Angkor was hit by severe climate instability. What it's hit by is the transition from the medieval warm phase into the Little Ice Age, a characteristic period that's pretty bad for a lot of people all over the world. The critical thing is that as the aggregate temperature drops, extreme instability is induced into the monsoon system in Southeast Asia from mega monsoons to mega droughts. And that continues for about 150 years and then levels off into the world that we live in. The only knowledge we have of this condition is one drought in the 19th century, which very nearly brought down three or four of the states of Southeast Asia. We have no direct physical knowledge of what a monsoon of this magnitude compared to this magnitude would be like. But we can see their effects. If you look on the LIDAR imagery which we collected in 2012 of the center of Angkor, you can see all the residential systems and the housing and the water tanks and so on. And up here, you can see these strange brown lines and this irregular pattern. This is erosion. This is a view from there looking along this slot and looking at this landscape here. And these are the erosion damage features. When you go to Angkor and you stand on the Siem Reap River, which is in the old Siem Reap Canal, the river is between five and eight meters below the current ground surface. All this was eroded out and moved southwards so that in some of the big channels you get these immense deposits of coarse-grained sand. And when you go down to the south, of Angkor, between the center of Angkor and the lake. You go down into the great north-south drains. These are huge structures. These are 70 meters wide, 2 to 3 meters deep, 15 to 20 kilometers long. And they are completely filled with sand. What you see here is the edge of the bank of the canal, just here. And all this is sand filled. It's so well preserved that you can actually see cycles of deposition in it with no apparent disturbance at each of the brief stop phases. What we see is damage which took out the major water system of Angkor, gouged out the main connector canal through Angkor, and pushed all that sand southwards and buried the major canals in the south. And we can date it, because buried in the sand is well-preserved vegetation, preserved by water, which is dated precisely to that period when those mega monsoons are occurring. Now that we can combine the archaeology with that data, the dendrochronology data, which you saw earlier from Brendan Buckley's work in Vietnam. What is clear is that what happened to Angkor quite abruptly in the 14th century was that the main connector through the middle of Angkor was completely disrupted by amounts of water that it was not designed to carry. This entire river system and canal system eroded out, and this canal here, and in fact this one as well, and these, all filled with sand. And the crucial point about the water system of Angkor is you have to be able to move water this way in the north, and you have to be able to move water this way in the south. And once that is ruptured, none of that is possible. 
What that therefore means is that the erosion damage to Angkor terminated the capacity of this water system to shunt water to protect the farmers against water shortage. So exactly in a period when mega drought is occurring that prevents them from growing crops, they have no backup from this system. The system was broken. What is disturbing is that the end result is that Angkor up here is abandoned. But not only Angkor is abandoned, all of the entire urban heartland of the Angkorian state was abandoned. And in the following three centuries, towns are reconstituted around the periphery of that heartland, which are all very small and are largely mercantile-oriented, whereas this was largely state and religion-oriented. When the French visited Angkor in the 1860s, they talk about a vast, mournful forest with the lonely cries of birds. Within Angkor, in central Angkor, there were six villages. This was an urban system which had completely gone. Just again to make a brief comment to you about civilizations, this is not a lost civilization. You can be quite sure the Khmer never lost anything quite as large as Angkor Wat. It was described to the French by Khmer. And Mahout is simply the promoter. He didn't stumble on it in the jungle. So why is this significant? Well, the reason it's significant is that if you look at a diagram of recent climate change, I noticed, Michael, this was in your diagram earlier, this little tiny piece. This is the peak of the medieval warm phase, and essentially Angkor runs from here to here. It rides the medieval warm phase. This is where the Maya, classic Maya, cease. They end as the temperature rises. We're not quite sure what is going on in Sri Lanka, and one of the reasons for that is we don't have a direct proxy for temperature in Sri Lanka. We only have one in the mainland of India. And then here, in the drop down from the medieval warm phase to the little ice age, we have the demise of Angkor. All that instability that I showed you is occurring in here. So just to go briefly through these, this is Tikal in the Maya area. Uh, those of you who uh, like uh, Star Wars will recognize this as the rebel base in the first of the movies. This is where it ends. It ends in this extreme dip at the instability phase before the rise of the medieval warm phase. It has been assumed that this is all caused by drought. I would suspect, and it would be really interesting to get the climate modelers onto this, that this is actually a period of severe fluctuation between mega monsoons and mega droughts. And the end result, after the Maya, classic Maya have ceased, this area here, which is the classic Maya center, is effectively abandoned, returns to forest. And the post-classic Maya are in the north, and they are predominantly around the coast. When those great low-density cities of the Maya end, the population and the urban world moves out, what we call an urban diaspora, and you get small, compact, mercantile settlements around the periphery of the old Maya heartland. When you go to Sri Lanka, this is one of those great water tanks in the Sri Lankan cities. The uh, history is a problematic one. We're still trying to work out what is going on with Anuradhapura and Polonarua. Anuradhapura is the critical city. It has a long history back here. We don't quite understand what is going on here because we suspect that this is not what is happening 
to temperature in Sri Lanka. This is rather further north in India. And pollen arrower is a very short burst attempt at reviving that system. So we don't quite know what's going on here in the relationship between climate change and the low-density cities. But the pattern is this is where Anuradhapura and Polonarua are. For a short period, there are towns here. And then the peripheral model develops. And the cities are around the edge. And then later on, Kandy develops up in the hills. This characteristic pattern of a move out to the periphery of the heartland occurs. So if you put the three of them together, this is the Cambodian one, this is the Khmer heartland, and where the later towns occur, they also incidentally are all around here as well, in Thailand. This is the Maya one, the old classic Maya lowlands and the later settlements, and this is the pattern in Sri Lanka. This area in the 19th century, when the British took over, was almost completely empty of people. And it's an interesting piece of modern history because the British explorers and uh, civil servants who came into this area reported to the British government that there were extensive rice management and water control systems in here, which were completely unused. And the British promptly forced people from the south of Sri Lanka to move into this area to reconstitute the rice production system and re-engage the relationship between the Tamils in the north and the Sinhalese in the south. This area was essentially an empty zone. So what we see is when you look at the initial trajectory places, that's things like Cahokia and Great Zimbabwe, you get this pattern. You get lack of continuity, and you get heartland disintegration. When Cahokia disappears, there's nothing in the area after it. A huge region goes out. The Yoruba are interesting because it didn't happen there. So that's a matter of some real interest. When you look at the agrarian urban systems, you get exactly the same phenomenon of long durations. The great low-density cities are kept going for a long time. And they're astonishingly rich and powerful. But when they go, there is no continuity, and there is this heartland disintegration. Interestingly, there is a low-density case in Myanmar, which is relatively small. It's only covered about 90 square kilometers, where you do not get heartland disintegration. And one of the really interesting features of Pagan is that Pagan's food sources were not where the city was. They were 100 to 200 kilometers away. And one of the interesting possibilities is that this prevented the breakdown of the crop system at the same time as the urban breakdown. One of the things to investigate. The question is, does any of this have any significance for this? And I'll come back to Sydney. Sydney hasn't collapsed yet, so I'll I don't I hope not, anyway. My children's there. One of the interesting scalar phenomena that you see, and this is also relevant if you extrapolate this situation onto the present, is that if you are relatively small and your states are extremely small, Maya states were rarely more than 100 kilometers across, you see a very striking situation. Lisa Lucero has shown really decisively how the Maya kings locked up water. They put their great cities where water was not readily available, built reservoirs to control the relationship to water. When the system cracked, the credibility of the rulers vanished, and there were no more Maya rulers. And what you get afterwards is small states go down to mini states. In Sri Lanka, Anuradhapura controlled the whole of the island. It's a mini empire. The rulers endure, and you go down to numerous small states. Angkor controlled 
the largest mainland Southeast Asian empire. The rulers endured. The Khmer, really tough. That cultural system hung in. It did what the Romans did. It moved sideways, created a new capital. But you went from an empire down to a state. So there appears to be a baseline of if you start from something really big in the low-density system, you may actually be able to hang in. So what is the implication? Why does this resonate somewhat disturbingly with the present? Uh, you can imagine that as an archaeologist, I began to feel a little queasy when I started listing these things. We use giant low-density urban settlements. We are heavily dependent on massive infrastructure, which is what broke in Angkor. We substantially clear and alter our landscapes. In Angkor, there was no tropical forest. In Angkor, they had removed thousands of square kilometers of tropical forest to produce rice fields. And we are now in a situation where severe climate change appears to be in progress. What would be the significance of this? Let's have a look at a hypothetical. This is for you, Sheila. Go back to that reconstructed temperature. The Maya went out here. The Khmer went out here. Those are the trends of change. This is the current trend of climate change. Notice it doesn't matter whether the temperature is going up or going down. The instability occurs. This is another diagram of the same phenomenon. This is a very disturbing diagram which Tim provided to me. These are the areas of critical change which are going on. They coincide with China, Japan, Europe, and North America. And this is where the giant low-density cities of the modern world are located. The East Coast Megalopolis, the European Randstadt Complex, the three in Japan and China, and the Japanese Taiho Belt along the eastern side. This is an example of the East Coast Megalopolis. This shows the phenomenon of interconnectedness. This is a commuter map of the East Coast Megalopolis. It would strongly suggest that computer map analysis is what we will need in order to understand what interconnectedness actually means in these great low-density systems. It would seem on the model of Angkor that these low-density cities are potentially extremely vulnerable to the effects of severe climate change and that what it is likely to do is to take out directly or indirectly, some major component of the inertial, massive infrastructure of these cities. And the key problem about that is that once those massive inertial systems break, they are extremely difficult to recover. So if you follow that model of low-density collapse, and heartland dispersal, what you would find in North America is that the east coast of the United States drops out as an urban world, and the urban world migrates out in every direction. The same in Europe. The south of England, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium area drops out and the urban world moves out. In Japan, the urban world would have to move to the mainland. In China, Bohai, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, it would move into central western China, down into Southeast Asia and the Philippines. The effect would be to create a wholly new world, a new world of 
small, compact cities outside these old urban zones. Interesting question whether Mumbai, which is comparatively small at the moment, would be able to survive, would be robust enough to survive on the lines of Pagan. Maybe Mexico City, because it's sufficiently high up, might get away with it. Notice some interesting phenomena. If Singapore can keep itself small, it is a very robust survivor. It is perfectly capable of plowing enormous quantities of resources into keeping itself going. Being small in urban systems is to be exceptionally muscular. Fortunately, Sydney, which is down here, should also be able to cope. It's a relatively low density city. It covers about five to 6,000 square K, average density of under 20 persons per hectare. But very interestingly, the government of New South Wales has just redefined Sydney as a triple city. Sydney on the coast, Parramatta, and Penrith. So if we have a sea level rise problem, we already have a mechanism for moving our urban center inland to Parramatta. We are relatively small. We can jump. The diagram you showed of our ability to jump in different directions. Some of us have choices. This is the broader point. And it's the broader point for modeling of what we're looking at in our world. The form of cities is not neutral. It's not just something that's background that we run around in and do stuff. It itself, its material form, is a variable in its own right, affecting our capacity to adjust and survive. It is the material which affects the resilience and the survivability of the social. We tend, from short time span views, to view the material as just an epiphenomenon, just a derivative of what social life does. It is not. The material, particularly in our world, and the scale at which we construct, is an actor without intent. It was an actor without intent in Angkor. The juxtaposition of that mega infrastructure and mega drought created a problem that the population, the social system of Angkor could not solve in place. What we need in order to cope with these circumstances is models which systematically incorporate the non-correspondence between the materiality and sociality. We need examples. The interesting case of the Maya, Sri Lanka, and Angkor, where you have a similar outcome from a very different base. The Maya had no quadrupeds. The Maya were growing rice. The Sri Lankans were managing water and rice directly. The Khmer appear not to have managed water at all. They built stuff, but they didn't manage. So three very different systems in low-density cities under the impact of climate change led to a very similar outcome. It is those kinds of assessments which we need to use the past for. It's not a matter of a Cassandra proposition of saying, oh, all these places died in the past, so we're all going to die. That's not the case. What the past says is that some systems fail and some systems are robust. And we need to go and find out why they were robust in order to assess what we can do about our present world and to look at patterns of outcome. My thanks to a very large number of people, particularly again to Jan and to Karen, who is immensely patient with the questions I sent her by email, deeply appreciated, and to many of my colleagues who've worked with me in the field, particularly my Khmer colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland, for that very interesting talk. Actually, 
I had to get used to the thought that I'm living in a low-density city. I not here. Not yet, but not, I, here. not here. But not here. I always associate the big cities with high density, but oh, yes. that's something uh, that's new. Now we have time for questions. Thank you very much for your lecture. I was wondering whether you could see any correlation with the technological evolution and the technological innovations that were brought up by these civilizations and how they affected the, uh, the, the changes in the, in the city scales that you have described. Thank you. Well, the, the three cases of the great agrarian low-density cities all have very substantial innovations in water management. The uh, Sri Lankans actually have the biggest water reservoirs of the pre-industrial world, which they built like we would build them by building a dam across a valley. The Maya have an interesting problem. There's very little free water on the surface in the Yucatan Peninsula because it's limestone. These big places like Tikal are deliberately built on the tops of hills where there is no water, and then they build cascade reservoirs coming down from the top along different sides of the city. And it was that engineering which kept the systems going until there were serious water defaults. The worry of Angkor is that the Angkorian system is the largest single urban water management system on Earth. To give you some idea of how spectacular, it depends upon a device called the Barai. A Barai is a reservoir. Reservoirs are rectangular. They're completely constructed by human beings. And what is astonishing about the Barai is that it's built above the ground. The banks of the West Barai are 100 meters thick and 10 meters high. There's 15 million cubic meters of dirt in the banks of one of those reservoirs. And it contains 50 million cubic meters of water. The reason for doing that is that if on an almost level plane, you bump a big body of water up above the landscape, it gives you the freedom to move the water in many different directions, including back against the gradient. The Barai system comes into being in Southeast Asia with the Khmer and only with the Khmer shortly before the beginning of the medieval warm phase. And my guess would be that the Barai is the reason for the endurance and the maintenance of the Khmer system through that crisis period of the beginning of the medieval warm phase because it's a method of risk management. It's a storage system for protecting yourself against instability in the monsoon. So it was, in, its, in essence, the magic tool developed, in fact, before the problem arose. But it is that mega engineering system that once it's 500 years old, by the time you get to the 14th century, is the problem because it locks the water system of Angkor into an unbudgeable series of channels. The water cannot go anywhere other than that it is directed. There is too much water. It's beyond the design specifications of the system, and it tears out the whole unit. So the problem, and it's surely the thing we now know about technology, nuclear weapons being the classic example, we can invent them, we can make them, they are useful to us, but the great technologies we create are a material phenomenon in their own right that is a variable in its own right that affects our cultures. And we have to bear that risk in mind. That, I think, is the serious lesson. So what we have to think about with our cities and our world is the degree to which we are encasing ourselves in equally useful but unbudgeable systems. That will be my concern. What, does change, what did change when we look at the modern world, actually, we have a globalized world. Yeah. We actually get to step out of the regional world which we had at that time. That means it adds much more flexibility. You may have droughts in North America, yeah. but not in Africa and Asia. That's right. And we, have, we still have, if we are not destroying kind of the, the transport mechanism, 
to support these structures. Yep. Do we have any feeling that actually the size of the hinterland uh, on the long run helps this structure to survive or not? Well, my feeling <clears throat> from the description of the Maya, Sri Lanka, and Angkor is that clearly the sheer size of the Khmer Empire helped it for a while. Uh, it was under impact from the outside. There were two outside populations that were attacking it. But clearly, it could pull an enormous amount of resources out of them, and it did. And that probably allowed it to endure and keep itself alive. So that's a significant point. And it would suggest that in our world, if this crisis hits places like the East Coast megalopolis and the Chinese cities, those states are in themselves big enough to carry the problem, but only to reconstitute themselves further out. So scale is critical. The other important part of the question you've raised is a serious one that we always have to consider. And this is where we need to develop really a more rigorous logic of the use of the past. What is the relevance of the past to the present? Sometimes we talk about it as if it's enormously relevant, and sometimes we talk about it as if it's completely irrelevant. One argument would be that nothing that happened to the Khmer or the Maya or the, the Sinhalese is of any relevance in the present at all. They didn't have a system that allowed them to understand what was happening. We do. They didn't have massive distributed systems for moving resources. We do. The counter to that would be to say that what is happening in our cities is that our cities are more than a thousand times larger than theirs were. And much more worryingly, our cities, and they have been since the 19th century, are growing a thousand times faster. So we may be able to look ahead but are we able to look ahead fast enough? But we need a much more sophisticated way of appraising the past and how we would use it in the present and the future. It's not a simple relationship, and I'm not arguing that it is, but that's a fair comment. What are the resiliences built into other bigger systems? Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, one of the arguments about the lack of resilience of the growing megacities, especially in the global south, is the dependence on the transport infrastructure for food um, in particular. Because, um, you know, it, it applies in, in the UK and my country. <coughs> so, for example, we have about three days' worth of fresh food in the country and about ten days' worth of dried food in the country. If our east coast ports through which most of the food comes were blocked, how would we get hold of our food? Right. You know, it's not possible to airlift in food very easily for a developed world country, let alone a developed world city anymore. <clears throat> so if something like Sao Paulo or Dar es Salaam lost its ports at the same time as we have some sort of drought or uh, lack of ability in the rural hinterland to grow food and lack of infrastructure in the rural hinterland to bring food into the city, then you could imagine a situation very much in line with what you've been describing yeah. about Angkor, that the, the only way to get food into that city is by the ports, and if you lose the ports because of some storm surge or something like that, they're not going to be out for 24 hours, they'll be out for months and months and yeah. months. So I think there are very powerful analogies between what you're talking about and some of our cities. The issue is, in my experience, um, dealing with uh, complex decision-making at government, is that it is very, very difficult to get over this hurdle that technology will solve it, the market will solve it, there's no point in us investing because it will never happen, it's a black swan event, yeah. and so on. So do you have any arguments about, you know, you, you've clearly talked with decision makers about the analogies with Angkor. Yeah. Do you have any kind of arguments about how you can put forward some of these discussion points to make people actually think about what would happen if, rather than just say, it will never happen? Well, I have to say that one of the nice things about Angkor is it's very pretty. And people know about it. And tourism is useful. People go there. 
Um, so you can catch people's attention, and we have a BBC program about it and so on. So there's that superficial sense that it's something you can sell. People will pay attention. When you get to the business of how would you make an argument that would persuade a government to deal with a problem preemptively, you guys have described in meticulous detail how unstraightforward that actually is. Our systems, it seems to me, uh, from the descriptions I've heard of uh, cyber warfare and so on, are that if the threat is in your face, we're capable of moving fairly fast. What worries me with the descriptions you've been giving about the problem of trying to rectify a problem once it exists is that that's exactly the problem in Angkor. Once the problem was in their face, it was irretrievable. They could not get it back. They did try. We have found, in fact, that part of the water system was actually repaired. So they had enough muscle to get in there and try and keep it going. But it's minuscule. It's like an area in this corner of the room that they're repairing to get water back into a main enclosure. The rest of the system, they could do nothing with at all. So I think the core issue is how do we move addressing this kind of issue in two directions. One is obviously to try and get more information to the top end of government and to policymakers. Another presumably would be to get it into the international organizations like the World Economic Forum and so on might be one way to go. But it seems to me that there's a third one which has been raised on occasions, and that is go to the grassroots. Are there things which people can do at a grassroots level which they will perceive as worthwhile, that they will start doing in order to try and deal with these situations? I have to say, I have a nine-year-old daughter. I have two families, one boy who's 32 and a nine-year-old girl. And I sit here and I think about her in 2060 when she is going to be dealing with whatever we're talking about. And it really, really bothers me. We have somehow got to get people, she's only nine, kids 15, 20 years of age, engaged with the idea that they need to do something about this situation. Because we're not going to do it on our own. And to be fair to our governments and the people in our governments, They've got stuff in their face all the time. They are incessantly having to deal with right now. And we have to recognize that that is their job. We have to somehow work out how to get this longer planning model into being. And that, I think, will take quite a number of people like yourselves who are actually engaged in the business of government to see how we should do that. I would be glad to assist, especially by showing nice pictures of Angkor Wat. Over here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, you said at the beginning of your talk that the implications of climate change will be particularly strong for big cities which are low density. And then you partially answered my question when you said that scale is very important. I was wondering which is the, the population cap that you, we have to consider to say, okay, implications are going to be strong for these cities because they are above this population level and they are low density. And then I was also wondering if there are some cases in which, due to the context, I guess the region or surrounding areas, uh, this will not hold? Like they can be low density and still be resilient? Can you think about some two examples of the current world to compare? Let me just flick on a bit. Um, let's get this diagram. Broadly on this diagram, um, any low-density modern city that is larger than 10,000 square K and is down here is in real trouble because the key, and you see this with Angkor, is once you're down here, you can't go back up. You can't redensify yourself. The reason you can't redensify yourself is that Angkor didn't have the communication systems to work up here. 
Likewise, our great low density cities do not have the communication systems that work up here. We don't even know what they are. There's another major transition here that would develop those kinds of technologies. So down here, you're in serious trouble. Populations 30 to 80 million at the moment in places down here, but it's the fact that they're more than 10,000 square K in extent, which is the troubling problem. And that's one of the reasons why I actually want to develop a research project which is showing how we can consistently describe the size of urban space because we actually do not have a consistent index to do that yet. You can look at a photograph and say, well, obviously, that's roughly how big it is. But the boundaries of these places, edges of them, probability and uncertainty is, is really undefined. So that's one group there. If you're here, which is Sydney with about 6 million people in it and about a residential density of between 10 and 25 on average, you have a lot of options. You could drop down this way and then nick back up again. You could rise gradually or you could rise steeply. Uh, we are in the process in Sydney of beginning an infill, deliberate infill, but we are in fact extensifying the place at the same time. So if you're here, you have quite a lot of options. If you're Singapore and you're higher density and you're up here, you've got lots of options. So where you are on this matrix is a critical definition of the degree of optionality available to you. So it's a bit like the diagram that you produced of water and population. This is a boundary conditions diagram, just like that one was. And you can start to use this kind of model, which is extremely simple, to get some hang of the risks and the possibilities of the cities that you're talking about. So that, that will be the real problem down there. There's nowhere to go. You can't go to higher density. You could keep on getting bigger. But there are problems inherent in getting bigger anyway. And you can see the limit condition here and the limit condition here. So that would be, those would be my big worry. Shashi. Really fascinating presentation. Much more interesting than terrorism or, or cyber, cyber security. Um, question on the muscle, which you've just briefly alluded to. Yeah. It strikes me that some of the civilizations you're talking about, I think particularly the ones in maybe South America, would need uh, their basis to be, of existence to be predicated on military acquisition and conquest, and presumably conquest of resources. And the corollary is that you would probably, I think, to keep the vast irrigation system or the networks or the barais in existence and serviceable, you would need a, a system of what we would call government, I guess, akin to despotism. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you need a mass base of labor and an organizing principle yeah. to, to service your, your edifice and also to, uh, uh, to keep yourself going. Yeah? So my question is, you've shown conclusively that some of the key civilizations and cities did get hit by climate events or, or ages. But it may well be, I'm not sure if the historians would argue this, that the kind of despotism is inherently uh, unstable just by its very nature. In Angkor, you know the, the evidence. Uh, from what I remember, you had a particular one, I think two kings who were very, very well known. They were the builders. They were probably the apogee, the, the high point of the Angkorian civilization. But you also have many who were perhaps not so strong and uh, perhaps weaker, who were not able to keep the, uh, the whole system up and running. So if you believe that argument, is Angkor's fate and similar civilizations' fate actually of eventual decline, the climate or the, the, the mini ice age event is, is a double whammy. It hits them, but they were actually on this long, uh, slow road to an eventual terminus. Would you have any um, sympathy for that kind of view? And secondly, unrelated, you've not talked about the Indus Valley uh, townships or cities like Monjdaro. Right. Could, you, could you shed some light on the reasons for their eventual uh, decline? 
or two, two separate things. Let's deal with the Indus first. The Indus are very small, compact, extremely dense, and extremely muscular. These are tough places. The real breakthrough that's just occurred in Indian archaeology is that it's been a convention until about five years ago that the Indus civilization urban system broke down. There was then no urbanism in India, and then the Gangetic civilization developed further to the north. It has now become clear that that's not the case. There is a continuous formation of urban, compact, tight urban settlements moving northwards. And as the Indus fades out, the more northerly ones come into being, and it's that that runs continually across to the Gangetic system. So I'm very relieved by that because the general phenomena worldwide is that once compact cities get into a region, you cannot get them out. They're a serious virus. Once they're in, they've got their teeth in there, and they can hang in. You can burn and sack them, and 20 years later, there's another one on the other side of the river. And the Indus was always worrying. So I'm very pleased that that story has changed. It is now the case in India that once you have urbanism in the south, in the Gangetic system, it never lo loses the from the landscape. It appears that one of the serious problems for the Indus was the disappearance of an entire river. The Shravasti, which is to the east of the Indus, just disappears. And that takes out two of the major Indus cities and would appear to have broken the structure of that system. But that urban world then moved northwards. So that's the immediate explanation. Why the Shravasti faded away, I'm not entirely sure, whether that's external water supply or a change in the topography. That's an interesting question. To come back to your other question about the, the Khmer, um, to give you some idea of how muscular and powerful the Khmer are, one of the queens of a ruler in the late 12th century wrote an inscription about the shrine of the Prekhan, where she specifies the allocation of gold to decorate the shrine. At minimum, the figure she is referring to is 15 tons. It may be 60 tons. 15 tons of gold is one point something billion dollars worth of gold. One shrine, that's a room about the size of that space there. That's how muscular these guys are. That is conquest gold. These people are powerful, military, and violent. The other thing they are is powerful managers, but in a very interesting way. One of the inscriptions in Pimai just laconically remarks, bring in for corvée labor, that's required labor, the people of categories two, three, and four. So this is a state that's pretty organized about how it deals with labor. And what it's doing is it's moving labor all over the landscape to repair big road embankments, construct temples in Angkor in the dry season, and so on. And they're extremely good at doing that. The comments I made earlier to you, Sasha, is that the really interesting feature of the Khmer Empire is it has no water management, it has no officers for water management, it declares no interest in water. The rulers just say, oh, I built a reservoir or I built a something else. And then the only thing you hear the rulers of the Khmer world talk about is tax. It appears that what they did was to build the infrastructure and say to the rest of the population, that's your problem. We just want the tax. So it's a really interesting phenomenon to look at about how you organize it. There does appear to be the problem that the Khmer rulers are associated because of their religious significance, their aspects of gods, which is always a dangerous thing to be. Um, they are tied up with the business of maintaining the workings of the cosmos. And when the water system goes wrong, Farmers are pretty robust about the notion that you're not managing the cosmos terribly well. 
and the implication is, well, certainly with the Maya, the Maya rulers just vanish. They just disappear. You see them no more. What the Sri Lankan and Khmer rulers do is they move sideways, and they remake themselves as mercantile rulers. So it's their versatility that's crucial in this environment. But their capacity to deal with the problem in the 14th century is twofold. One is that the population of Angkor was already dropping because there had already been a water crisis in the 13th century. The first half of the 13th century was a very bad succession of droughts. And that almost certainly had started to pull out the population of the city. So they may have dropped below a critical level at which they could keep repair going. The other one, and this is where we need a much more sophisticated way of dealing with the significance of the past, is you could, on the other hand, say absolutely everything was changing in Southeast Asia at that time. Theravada Buddhism was coming in. The European trade routes were coming in. Power was moving towards the coast. The climate was changing. There are any number of changes going on all the time. But presumably the problem in historical studies is that that's true all the time. There's always change going on. And what we don't have is a sophisticated enough cross-comparative method of assessing what the key variables are. The profound advantage of the Angkor study is that you can see the water, you can see the monsoon crisis, you can see the erosion, and you can date the erosion, and you can see the redeposition. So you've got a very tight link there. It has to be said for the Maya that we have no such tight link. All we have is huge droughts, and no more kings, and nobody in the cities. We don't have a really decisive link for the Maya. Not, not yet. So your comment is very fair. One final point to make. I really liked your talk yesterday. I wouldn't underrate cyber at all. Uh, the reason I wouldn't is that in this diagram, when the Industrial Revolution occurs here, it is using technologies developed in very small places. So for instance, the Victorian printing press, which makes this transition possible, depends upon the Gutenberg press, which is about two square meters and was developed over here. I would reckon that our current digital technologies are about the standard of the Gutenberg press. And the stuff that we will be using will be like a three-story, the equivalent scale transformation of a three-story Victorian printing press. I think we're in child's play at the moment. I think in two centuries' time, the iPhone will look hysterically funny. <laughs> people say, what on earth were you doing? You know, really. You know, people like me used to use typewriters. I think that's what it's going to look like. Okay, last question for Kerry. Roland, it seems to me that one of the things that we will be able to quantify that's different about what you were talking about over the last 2,000 years and what we're looking forward to is the temperature changes, the, the, the long-term centennial backdrop temperature changes from the middle legal warm period to the little ice age were a half a degree centigrade, right? Yes. And so we're talking about now the climate science are projecting three to six degrees centigrade. So I would really doubt that uh, uh, conurbations in eastern China will be able to move down to Indochina because the temperatures are going to be six degrees warmer on average. Mm -hmm. So that's going to give us a problem that previous cultures didn't. That is, uh, we need different kinds of crops. We can't grow mm -hmm. stuff down here anymore because yep. it's too hot, right? So, so that's one thing. It seems to me we are on the verge of being, we, we can quantify quite well. It's going to be an order of magnitude different uh, background temperature sure. change. Um, I would certainly agree. Just to be um, much more worrying, uh, the low-density cities aren't going to move. The low-density cities are going to die. They're going to break up. All the investment value, all the property value is going to vanish. 
And what will happen is that an urban world will be remade from the enterprise of the people who are out on the periphery of their heartland. Being in the middle, being in these great low-density cities when they go down will be very bad news. What is even more disturbing, though you can read it another way around, is that if these peripheral reformations can't occur to the south, presumably the Arctic's going to become a little more amenable. So what you'll get is these arcs will start moving northwards. But that's clearly the kind of modeling that one could do relatively readily. The problem is that we don't know whether this is going to happen, and we don't know when it's going to happen, but my concern would be exactly the one you expressed. If this kind of problem occurred for pre-industrial cities on a half or one degree change, and we are now playing in a four degree change with things going four, a thousand times faster, we should start looking at this relationship. It would seem worth modeling and somewhat worrying to me. Okay, Just my, your, your concern about your nine years old daughter reminded me of a discussion I had in 1961, I think, with my father. I was 16 years old, and the Cuba crisis was about to explode into a third world war. And my father had gone through the first and the second world war, so I said to him, Daddy, you really made a big mess out of this world. Look, the third world war is coming. And he looked at me and he said, son, you're absolutely right. Now it's your turn. <laughs> well, I know exactly so, what my daughter will say. She's a robust little so, kitty. <laughs> well, I, I, I think we, we should thank um, uh, Roland for his thank great you. talk.